in the house of God, re- getting ready to worship him. If you're new here, or if you just need something to be prayed for, we have a connection card located in the seat back pocket right in front of you. All we ask is you fill it out with as much information as you feel comfortable with and stick it in the offering plate at the end of the service. We here as a staff at Meeting House, every Tuesday we meet and we go over your prayer requests and we take them seriously. So if you have something that needs to be prayed for, no matter how small it is, I encourage you just to write it down and stick it in the offering plate. So before we get started, let's just go ahead and pray and just prepare our hearts and minds to worship God this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Thank you for the day that you've given to us. God, this is another day where we get to wake up, we get to glorify you and honor you because this is a day that you've given to us. Lord, as we get ready to go into our our worship, we go into hearing what your word has to say, I just ask that you fill this place with your spirit this morning. God, that you, you push out all the distractions that we've got going on in our lives and that we just focus solely and wholeheartedly on you this morning. And God, when we leave this place I just ask that we take everything that we've learned from your word and we apply it to our lives during the week and that we take this and we grow from it and we stretch our relationship with you. And God, just bless this service this morning. In your son's holy name, amen. Amen, church. Let's uh, let's spend a few minutes doing just what Bobby said and, and worship together and thank God for all he's done. And let's sing for a few minutes here and worship him.
I sing, my hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing Cornerstone. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, in the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. And in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within a veil. My morning to welcome you in this place and acknowledge and thank you and worship you for uh, what you've done and who you are, what we get to sing about and celebrate and gather together um, about, Lord. It's, 
It's good news. It's the gospel, Lord, what Jesus Christ has done for us by coming to the earth 2,000 years ago um, to make us right with God. And so we thank you. Uh, just glorify yourself this morning. Just draw us closer to you, Lord, wherever we're at. Um, just speak to us today through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated. And kids, uh, you can make your way back and find your teachers for Meeting House Kids. Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Yeah? Everybody about five pounds heavier now? I am at least five pounds. Uh, well, first of all, let me say, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is James Thomason. I'm the lead pastor here at Meeting House Church. And uh, Bobby, uh, who announced, uh, who said welcome to us, he's our youth pastor, and Caleb is our, our worship leader, worship pastor. Um, and uh, if we have not had a chance to say hello, after the service, I will be standing right back there under the words Connection Center, and I would love to get the chance to meet you, okay? And uh, I want to say uh, thank you for the, the gift that you, uh, Meeting House Church, gave to me and my family uh, on Christmas Eve. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real blessing, and uh, it is a joy to pastor Meeting House Church. I can't you guys make it so easy, um, and, and I, I'm grateful. Uh, and then uh, also, I've got a Christmas shirt on. Anybody wearing anything they got at Christmas? Yeah? Raise your hand if you're wearing something you got for Christmas, right? Okay, good. Now, uh, and with that, I want to say this. We did this before Christmas, but uh, I want to do it now again. If you or your family uh, you know, are, are having difficulty you know, financially right now, I've been there, um, and our family's been there, uh, we, are, we would like to help you out. If you were, if you were in a, a situation where you couldn't uh, provide things for, the, for your loved ones, uh, please let us know. We are more than happy, uh, and, and it's, it's our job uh, to, to help out, and we would love to do that, okay? So you can see me or Bobby or Caleb uh, if that applies to you, we'll keep everything on the down low. We're not gonna, we're not gonna get up here and, and say, hey, look what we gave to so and so. We're not, you're not gonna embarrass anybody that way. We just want to be a blessing, like God has asked us to be. Okay, and we did that already with one family, and maybe next week I'll read their, uh, their, uh, their testimony as a result of it, uh, with while keeping them, um, unknown <laughs> to us. Okay. All right, uh, we're in, uh, so we just finished Advent, right? Advent is, about, is, is really about, it's the coming of Christ, the coming of Christ, the first coming of Christ or appearing. Uh, Christ's first Advent is, is Christmas. And guess what? Christ is going to have a second Advent, right? When, when we call it his second coming, or the Bible calls it his parousia. That's the Greek word that's translated coming. So Christ is coming back again. God is not finished with his creation. He is not finished with humanity. Did you know that? Uh, he's not. Um, and, and Christ is coming back. And let me just say this. You'll probably hear this a number of times uh, today. Life is preparation for Christ's return. You want to say that with me? Life is preparation for Christ's return. It is. It's, it's preparation for Christ's return. And so uh, we're looking forward to Christmas future, if you will, Christ's second advent, his second coming. And what I thought I would do is just give us a, a real bird's eye, you know, 30,000 foot survey of coming events so we can see what God has in store for his church and the world, all of humanity, and even the heavens and the earth. And Satan, by the way. Uh, we're going to see all that really quickly. Now, I've got a lot of references up here. Um, we put everything on YouTube. So if you want those, of course, everybody carries a camera in their pocket now. You can take a picture if you so desire to get those references. But we're, we're not going to go through every reference. There's a ton of them, right? And, and it would take months and months, really, to 
few months to go through it in detail, but we're going to cover it uh, bird's eye view today. Sound good to you guys? Good. All right. So let's begin here with the church age in our, our, our next slide. Um, and, and these are the first four stages. I, that now, of course, depending on how we chop it up, we could turn this into, we're going to have nine stages. That's including now, the church age. We could chop it up a little bit finer and maybe come up with 12 or 15 stages, but these are the big stages. So right now, we are in uh, the church age, right? The, the church age started with Christ's birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and the sending of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. That's the inauguration of the church age. Prior to that, it was, we would call it the, I would call it the, 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 the Israel age, the, the God's chosen people, were, were the, the nation of Israel, were God's witness on earth. Now, uh, it's God's church, which is the body of Christ, his witness on earth. And the church, of course, includes Jew and Gentile. From God's perspective, there's only two groups of people uh, naturally. There's Jewish people, right, who began with Abraham, um, and then there's Gentiles. And the church is, com is, is the combining of, of Jew and Gentile believers. And the Bible even says that as, as Gentiles, non-Jews, we become children of Abraham by faith, right? And so the church is the body of and the union uh, of Jew and Gentile uh, on the earth, okay? And we'll see that God is not finished with the nation of Israel here today. So this is where we are now, and, and you'll see we cover this kind of in Revelation. You'll see some references to Revelation almost in every spot. And so the first three chapters of Revelation represent the church age. And it, the church age ends with Christ with what we call the rapture, okay, of the church. But before we get to that next point, I want us to look at uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 6, 7, and 8. Because broadly speaking, Jesus has given his church something to do during the church age, right? We're, we're not just to be idle. And here it is. So let me set the stage. Christ is about to go to the top of the Mount of Olives just outside of Jerusalem and ascend, return to heaven. And then 40 days later, he's going to send the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, okay? So they're, they're, they're outside Jerusalem, and his disciples ask him this question. Lord, Christ has already died and resurrected, right? Lord, are you at this time going to do what? Restore the kingdom to Israel. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. Okay? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be what? My witnesses. In Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the age. And so, in two words... We can sum up what our job as Christ's body of believers on earth is. My witnesses. During the church age, the church is to be a witness of Christ to the rest of humanity. So that others can come to know and believe in him. That's broadly, broadly speaking, that's our job description during the church age. Okay. Now, I want you to notice something. It's not for us to know the times or the dates the Father has set, right? What, what they're asking is, hey, are you going to come and set up your earthly kingdom right now? Is it going to happen soon? So let me just say, anytime you hear a pastor or somebody on the internet or on TV or some church you go to and they say, I know the date that, uh, when it's coming, you can be for sure that they are not right. They do not know the date. They are not telling the truth. Does everybody see that? As a matter of fact, in another place, Jesus says, God has even kept it secret from him, the son. No one knows that it's God set by his own authority, and, but this day is coming. Okay? 
and it's imminent. This next thing, it means it's imminent. Okay, let's go to our next slide and look at it. And the next thing that's going to happen is what we call the rapture. Okay, the rapture of the church. And when I say it's imminent, what I mean is there is nothing that has to happen in, this, in, in, the, in the calendar, if you will, of eschatological events, last end days events, before the, ha- before the rapture. There's no signs leading up to it. Jesus, the Bible speaks of it as a thief coming in the night, right? As a, as a master who returns unexpectedly home to find his servants either ready for his return or not ready. So it's imminent. There's nothing that stands between us in way of signs uh, for Jesus' rapture. So let me just describe what this is. You can see the, 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 uh, the, the, the verses there. And, and right now, Christ is in heaven. Okay? He's seated at God's right hand. And all believers who have, who have died from past to present are with him. Right? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? Okay? And so, the day that the rapture occurs, Christ will come to earth, but to the sky. He will come into the atmosphere, right? But not all the way to the earth. At that moment, those people, their bodies who have died, believers who have died, their bodies, right? They have been with Christ in heaven Jesus will resurrect their bodies. They will become what we call resurrection bodies. They will no longer be uh, subject to to the the laws of thermodynamics and decay and sickness and weakness, right? And and they will be united with their resurrection bodies. Then those who are believers at that time on earth who are alive, their bodies will be changed into resurrection bodies, okay? And so, the passage in Thessalonians says, we will ever be with the Lord, okay? So that's the first thing that's going to happen. And, and there's no signs. There, Jesus speaks of signs, but they're about his specifically his second coming, not about the rapture of the church. Rapture means to catch up. To, God comes down and he plucks up his church uh, uh, off of the earth. Okay, prior to, oh, well, no, not prior. Let me let me let me jump to the judgment seat of Christ. I got ahead of myself. So, uh, and these two kind of take the, the next two happen simultaneously, if you will. Okay, the judgment seat of Christ. So, say if Christ came in two seconds, which biblically speaking, well, he would already come because two seconds have already passed. So let's say two hours. Okay, if Christ. Christ could, the rapture could happen in two hours, all right? At that moment, us, if, if none of us happen to pass away between now and then, we would not die physically. Christ would come, those, who were, those bodies that, were, that belonged to dead believers uh, would be resurrected, right? They would be reunited with their bodies, and our bodies after that would be changed, okay? Then we would return to heaven to be with Christ, and we would go experience the, what the Bible calls the judgment seat of Christ, okay? And this is a time when believers are judged not for their salvation, right? Because we receive that by God's grace, amen? Does everybody understand that? Salvation is a gift we receive from God because he freely offers it because he is wonderful and awesome, right? Forgiveness, right? Justification, he declares and makes us righteous in his eyes. He, he recreates us. He gives us a new heart, new mind. He writes his law in our mind and our hearts, okay? We are born again. We are adopted into his family. All that is by God's grace through our response of faith in Christ Jesus, okay? So that's, this is not what's being judged here. The moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, your eternity was set in stone, if you will. You, you are saved. You have eternal life. This is a judgment 
of what we have done with our salvation. How have we loved the Lord our God? How have we loved our neighbor as ourself? How have we shared the good news of Jesus Christ and been a witness? How have we loved our, our husbands and wives, our children, our moms, our dads? Right? This is, this is what the judgment seat of Christ is. And we'll look a little bit deeper into it in a minute. Then, during, while that's coming, this, this thing called the tribulation begins on earth. Okay? And it is a time when God pours out his wrath in judgment on rebellious humanity. It's seven and a half years long. It's divided into three sections. First three and a half years and the second three and a half years. The first three and a half years are part of the tribulation. The second three and a half years are called the great tribulation. Okay, we can, you can read about that. Almost most of the book of Revelation is about the, the tribulation period. Okay? Uh, during this time, despite it being a time of, of God's judgment upon rebellious humanity, many, many people, both Jew and Gentile, will come to faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? This is when we all know, anybody ever heard the word antichrist, right? This is when the antichrist comes to power. This is when there is one, and he, and he establishes a one world government and a one world religion, okay? Uh, and if you pay attention to globalism, uh, that might, uh, you, I think there's a little bit of evidence uh, for the book of Revelation. The push for globalism in our world. Uh, the push for uh, the uniting of, of the three Abrahamic religions. Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Uh, there, there's a push for, this, for these things. Now, let me just say this. Most of us are very, very comfortable with a Jesus who is invisible, right? A God who is invisible, Right when things are just kind of words and concepts, because they're not very concrete. We can we can play with words and with concepts. We can we can play in our minds with things that are not visible at the moment, and kind of make them into what we would like them to be. Can't we? You agree with that? But when we begin to talk about concrete things in relationship with God, going all the way back to did God send his son physically to become one of us, right? To take on a human body as we did. Then people start to say, well, you know, I, I agree with the concept of the son of God coming to, to earth, right? That, that's good. Sounds good, you know. But wait a second. You mean like he actually became one of us? Yes. That he actually lived a sinless life? Yes. That he actually was crucified on a cross in, in, in payment, in, in judgment uh, for our sin and the sins of the world to conquer our sin and death? That he died physically? That he conquered, right? Left our sin in hell, rose victorious over death and sin, and then ascended back to heaven? Like those things, like if I had a camera back then, I could have filmed it. Yes, that's what we're talking about, right? If, if I went up to Jesus and poked him, boom, I, my, my hand would not go through, okay? Real. And so, so when, we're, when people are very comfortable or more comfortable speaking of religion and God in terms of precepts and, 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 uh, and, and, and principles, and theoretically and mythologically, but when we begin to talk about concrete things, everybody gets a little bit scanty, right? And so now we're talking about Christ coming back physically to earth, right? And God doing things directly and visibly rather than behind the scenes on the planet, 
Yes, Christ is going to do that. So this is the, 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 the tribulation period. Okay, next slide. Then number five becomes what we specifically call the second coming of Christ. Christ will, at the, and he will wrap up this tribulation period by returning to earth at Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, the same place that he left in Acts chapter 1. And he will then uh, defeat the Antichrist. That's when, that's when this thing called Armageddon, you know, we make movies about Armageddon. We, we use Armageddon as, as, a, as, a, as a term to talk about terrible, you know, situations and everything. This is when uh, all the nations of the earth gather together against God, against the Lord and against his anointed one. And Christ returns. And there's, a, there's an awesome picture uh, of it. In, in, in Revelation chapter 19. Uh, just an awesome, awesome picture. As a matter of fact, let me read a little bit of it. Because it's just, it's just, whew, it's fantastic. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. The tribulation period and its description really end in chapter 18 in, in Revelation. And then, and then verse 11. I saw heaven standing open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one but himself knows. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. Now just to... I know we just got past Christmas, okay, but this is often misunderstood. Jesus here is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. And immediately we think about the crucifixion, his own blood. The blood that Jesus' robe is dipped in here is not his own blood. It's the blood of his enemies, of, of all the nations and armies and peoples of the earth who have gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed one. The armies of heaven were following him. That will be you and me, along with angels, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh... He has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So many of you are, you know, against tattoos. You don't feel like it's Christian. Well, Jesus has a tattoo on his thigh. <laughs> King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right? So he comes back. That's his second coming. At that point, the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown in what to in what is into the lake of fire burning with sulfur they're 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 finished where they will be tormented forever it says god's word says at that point now there is peace on the earth okay there's peace on the earth apparently human commerce and society goes on uh, rather normally there's business there's buying and selling there's building, there's, there's education, it's, it's life with Christ as physical king. The world's capital will be Jerusalem at this point, okay? Antichrist and the false prophet are taken out, and there's what is called the thousand-year or millennial reign of Christ on the earth. During this time, Jesus will, God will bind Satan. So yes, Satan is a real being. He's not just a concept, okay? Uh, and he will be bound in, in, a, in a place called the abyss, okay? For this thousand-year period. Um, and it's at this time that all Israel, according to my understanding, will be saved, okay? God has not forgotten his nation, Israel, 
okay? It's at this time where, where, where I believe the time of the Gentiles is over. The, the full number of the Gentiles, as it says in Romans chapter 11, have now come in, and, and now all Israel will be saved, okay? Uh, and now I don't want to get into too much description here, but at the end of this thousand years, Satan is loosed again onto the earth. God releases him out of the abyss and, and allows him to go over the earth. So this time of the thousand-year reign of Christ, right, everybody going into it is a believer. But by the end of it, not everybody is a believer. That doesn't mean someone, some people stop believing, okay? What it means is procreation will continue. And some of those who, who, uh, who are born will not be believers. And there's, or that unbelievers were left. There were some unbelievers. And at the, uh, I'm sorry to get into too much detail, but I just want to get a little bit, you know, uh, of detail that at Armageddon, you know, the understandings differ, but maybe it's just the great uh, men and women and leaders of the earth who are in rebellion against God who are destroyed. And then the rest of kind of normal humanity uh, continues to exist, okay? Uh, you can argue about that. I'm not, you know, don't come up to me and after the service and say, hey, you got that wrong. I'm saying, hey, look, it's, it's, it's all good. It, it's the future. It's prophecy, okay? Um, God will do it right. So Satan is loosed on the earth. He deceives many. Uh, he and those that he have deceived are called Gog and Magog in, in Revelation, come uh, and, 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 and surround Jerusalem, and there's no real war here. God just destro destroys them. Boom. Gone. Done. Uh, like a crisp, basically. At that, point, at that point, Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. Then there is what the Revelation calls uh, the great white throne judgment. All the dead, so there really hasn't been a resurrection except for believers at this point. So all the dead at that point are resurrected, right? And, they are, and, and this, this is pictured in Revelation, um, and raised and judged by Christ. And whoever's name was not found written, is not found written in the book of life, at that judgment will be cast into the lake of fire where... The Antichrist, the beast, I mean the false prophet, Satan are. Okay? And at that time, God creates a new heavens and a new earth. And there is eternity. And that begins in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. And maybe if we have time at the end of, this, uh, of the message today, uh, I will we'll read a little bit of that, just a little bit, to get a picture of what we're looking at. So there's kind of the broad scope with broad, with broad brushes, just, just the big bullet points, okay? Now, I, I want to tell, I want us to look at a parable, a story that Jesus told, uh, and he told many of them about these future things, about his return. And they all have pretty much the same points in them, okay? And he tells them they, they're broad brush strokes, okay? But what can we, he teaches this parable, and we can learn, okay, if this is the future that God has laid out, not only for his church, but for all of humanity, and for the planet, and for the new heavens and the new earth, that how then should we live in light of this future, okay? So let's look at that in Luke chapter 19, and we're going we're gonna to go quickly here as we have been. Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 11. Jesus is teaching on his second coming already. Okay? He's been speaking to the crowd and his disciples about his return. And in verse 11, he says, While they were listening to him, to this, he went on to tell them a parable, a story. Because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once again there's that sense they thought christ they did they missed christ's first coming 
The Jewish people saw Christ coming only to establish his kingdom on earth. They missed the part of the prophecies in the Old Testament that tell us that Christ was coming first to die and rise again for our sins and then return later. Okay? He said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then return. A man of noble birth is Jesus represents him who went to a distant country that's heaven so Jesus is telling them in in opaque terms that hey I'm, I'm going to ascend and return to heaven before I re be appointed king before I return to earth everybody see that Jesus is the man of noble birth the distant country is heaven he's going back to heaven to be appointed king, and then to return. Okay? Verse 13. So we called ten of who? His servants. And what did he do? He gave them ten minas. A mina is just a, a measure of money. Okay? Put this money, what? To work, he said, until I come back. Jesus is clearly telling us he's going away and he's coming back. But his who? Subjects, they hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to do what? Find out what they had gained with it. So Christ says, hey, I'm going away. Here's some, some gifts. Put this to work while I'm, go, while I'm gone. I return to heaven. I'm come back. Some of those servants, some of the subjects, he distinguishes servants and subjects, they didn't want him to be king. They didn't want him to go and be appointed king and come back. They didn't want him to reign over, him, over them. And he says, when I get back, servants... Put this to work, and we'll see how you did. Everybody follow that? Pretty straightforward. I don't want to be too, you know, I just want to make sure everybody gets it. So I hope I'm not going too slow. So obviously the servants are Christians, believers in general, right? To whom he gives ten minas. Those who trust and follow Jesus. Specifically at that moment, he was referring to Jews. In, in, in his presence, those who believed on him at that moment, okay? Generally, all believers. Minas, notice, they were gifts. He gave them each ten minas. They hadn't earned it. It was a gift given to them. So these minas represent our salvation. Salvation is a gift, right? We do not earn it. We receive it from God through faith, trust, reliance upon, acknowledgement of who Jesus is, what he's done, and our desperate need for him. Okay? So the minas represent our salvation. They also represent spiritual gifts, which we've looked at in depth recently. Our abilities, our skills, our life in general. Okay? And then he says, put this money to work. In other words, use what I have given you in the way of salvation, the presence of my Holy Spirit in you, the spiritual gifts that I've given you, your talents, the abilities that you have, the things that you've developed on your own, your life. Put it to use to serve me and my kingdom while I am gone. Everybody got it? In broad terms, we, we, we've kind of categorized this into three things here at Meeting House Church. Now, you won't find these words in the Bible, but they're summaries, okay? So what is my job as a believer and, and follower of Jesus Christ on this earth? We say it's three things from a study of the Bible, okay? It's to reach up, it's to reach in, and it's to reach out. The church and every believer's first job is to reach up in faith 
to God, to worship and glorify God. The, the church's first purpose for its existence is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? It is to worship God. Second Peter says that we are a spiritual house, each one of us being a living stone that God is building together to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his glorious light. Our first job is to worship God, to love him, to serve him, to praise him, right? That's the church's first, first job. The other two jobs come after that. The second, to reach in. We say to grow our relationship with God and one another, right? We, want to, we don't want to be just believers. We want to, Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I want to know my God, right? Not just believe in him. God, God wants us to know him, to trust him, to grow in relationship with him. To overcome the sin that is in our lives. To be sanctified. To live righteous, holy, joy-filled lives. Okay? To reach in. In my own relationship with God and then with Christ's body. Right? Love your neighbor as yourself. This is the second greatest commandment. To love your neighbor as yourself. And we've been focusing on this, right? How the church, folks, we have got to learn to love one another in the church, right? And we can't love one another as strangers. We can't love one another if we're only together for one hour a week, right? That's not, that's not what the BOAC, the Book of Acts church, did. It's not what Book of Acts Christians did. Right? God says to love one another deeply from the heart within the body of Christ. Right? So reach in and then reach out, right? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So that we think that, so what does that look like? Well, it looks like a lot of things. It means that, hey man, if I'm married, right? How do I serve? How, how do I, how do I, how do I, uh, Put this, these things to, to work that Christ has given me in my marriage. Well, I'm faithful. I love my wife. I love my husband, right? Marriage is a picture of, of God's relationship with his church, right? How do I put this to work in my, with my kids? I train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I, I disciple my children. I teach them about God, Right? How do I do it it's in, 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 in maybe a more formal way that we might think of? Well, I, I, I join in. I help my church body serve God and accomplish the mission that, that God has given the church to accomplish. I get involved in ministry. I learn. I, I, I become discipled. I put myself in that position where I become a competent Christian who can make his or her way in the world. And share the good news of Jesus Christ. Pray with other people. Teach other people. Love other people. Right? Those things. It includes what we might consider everyday life. And those things that we might consider just, oh, well, this is my spiritual service. Reach out. The subjects who hated him, those are non-Christians. People who don't trust and follow Jesus Christ. Specifically at that moment those Jews in there who rejected him. Generally, all who refused to believe in the Son of God. Let's go back to Jesus' story, verse 16. So Jesus gives the minas to ten minas to ten servants. He goes back, he's made king, he returns, and now it's time for evaluation, judgment. The judgment seat of Christ that we pointed out. The first servant first one came and said sir your mina has earned 10 more verse 17 what did what did jesus say what will jesus say to us here well done my good servant his master replied 
Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, do what? Take charge of ten cities. Second, the second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. I'll save the judgment seat of Christ for a couple of more things, and we'll get a little bit into that just for a second. Right? So here's, you get the picture. Christ comes back, and, and, we, and, and he says, hey, how'd it go? What did you do with what I gave you? How'd it go? And if we're faithful, and we've grown, then we will be rewarded. Not with salvation, okay? but with rewards in addition to salvation. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Our salvation is a gift from God, right? Rewards are, 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 are things that God gives to us, blesses us with because of our service to him as believers. Next, let's go back to Jesus' uh, parable here in verse 20. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is... Your mina, I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. Didn't put what God had given him to work as the other two servants did. This servant just wrapped it up in a cloth and, and kept it in his closet somewhere hidden. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. The servant said, you take out what you did not put in, you reap what you, do not, what you did not sow. Notice this Christian's view of Jesus. He is afraid of Christ. He considers Christ a hard man who takes out what he did not put in and reaps what he, does, what he didn't sow. Everybody see that? Is that a very good opinion of our Lord and Savior Jesus? It's, it's not, is it? It's not a biblical view. It's not a biblical view. It's not who Jesus is. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. Wow, that's powerful. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I would have collected it with interest? This servant misunderstood his king. This, this, this servant became a believer in life, but never allowed his or her mind to be transformed to un by, the, by God's word and God's spirit to understand who God is and what he is actually like. That God is the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, right? Maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet not letting the guilty go unpunished. That God is, is, is Jesus is not heavy. His commandments are not burdensome to us when we understand him. Right? This, this believer considered following Jesus hard work. He was afraid. Saw God as, as, a, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a perfectionist uh, who only waited for his children to make mistakes so that he could pounce. And as a result of this wrong idea of who his Lord was, he never served him. He never served him. He just held on to his salvation, and that was it. Let's go back to the story, verse 24. Then he said to those standing by, Take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they said, he already has ten. Let me stop right there. And here, so here we see, first we see judgment and reward, right? Two servants put what God had given them to work, to serve him and his kingdom, and Christ judged them and rewarded them. 
Here we see judgment and loss. A servant took what Christ gave him, did not put it to work, did not know, grow in, in his relationship with his Lord and Savior, and so was judged and suffered loss. Not loss of salvation, but loss of rewards. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says to the Corinthians and to us, he said, I laid a foundation as a master builder, speaking about the judgment seat of Christ. That foundation is Christ, Jesus Christ, the gospel. No other foundation can be laid except for, the, except for Jesus Christ, right? He is the foundation of our salvation, right? There's only one. Once we stand on that salvation, we are saved. But, Paul says, let everyone be careful how he builds on that foundation. Whether he builds with gold or silver or precious stones or wood, hay, or straw. Because the day, the day of the judgment seat of Christ, will bring it to light how we have built with what God has given us on that salvation. And he says it will our works will be tested with fire. So wood, hay and straw don't survive fire very well, do they? They don't, do they? Gold and silver when they are put in the fire, what happens? They get better. They're purified of impurities, right? And so Paul describes people as building with their lives, with what God has given them, with gold and silver and precious stones, others, believers who build with wood, hay, and straw. But he says, on that day, those who built with wood, hay, and straw will be saved yet as though by fire. In other words, you'll come through that judgment going, whoo, man, oh, that was close. Uh, right? Little, little comedy relief, but that's what, that's what it'll be, okay? That's this last servant. Paul speaks a couple of times. It's, it's kind of crazy stuff, you know? He speaks to one guy. He says, deliver him over to Satan. This is a guy who was in complete rebellion against God as a believer, so that the body may be destroyed, but the soul saved on the day of salvation, Right? Back to our story here, verse 26. He replied, I tell you that everyone who has more will be given. Again, judgment and reward. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. Judgment and loss. Not loss of salvation, but loss of reward. Verse 27. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them. Bring them here and kill them in front of me. Judgment and condemnation. Right? At the great white throne judgment, all, all, the, all will be resurrected and whoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire where the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan are. Okay? So Christ is coming back as king to rule, to judge, to save, to reward, and to condemn. Jesus' message, the Bible's message, every time it speaks of future things like this can be encapsulated into two words. Be ready. Be ready. Life is preparation for Christ's return. Life is preparation for eternity. Jesus, over and over again, be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Put your faith in me, Jesus says, so that when that day comes, you will be with your God and with your Savior. Be ready. 
Don't only put your faith in me, but serve me in this life. So when I come back, it will not be judgment and loss, but judgment and reward. Be ready. Let me read just a few verses from Revelation chapter 21 to see what we're getting ready for. Just a couple and we'll be done. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Folks, right now we live in the old order of things. Where there's weeping, there's crying, there's mourning, there's grief, right? But God is, is going to recreate a new heavens and a new earth. When we think about heaven, we often think of, right, someplace up in the clouds out somewhere, you know, where we're all on some kind of heavenly Prozac and wearing wings and strumming on harps and like, you know, halfway mentally there and halfway not, right? I hate that picture of heaven. It makes it so, like, who wants to go there, you know? I don't want to float on the clouds strumming a harp, kind of like half high on God, right? Do you? I don't. It's not. It's not a good place to picture, and it's not biblical. You know what I mean? So heaven is really, eternity is the new heavens and the new earth. Heaven will be here. It will be a new here. It will be a new universe. And there will be much to do. Okay? It will be a wonderful time. It will be better than anything we've ever, any, any excitement, any experience, any adventure, any joy, any happiness you've ever had on this planet will not compare with what God has in store for us. So life is preparation for eternity. There's so much, man, I could just go on. Death is not leaving home, it's going home. Death is not loss, it's gain. It is better to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. The day that you or I pass will be the, de- the best day we have ever lived in our life. The day that your believing loved ones have passed was the best day they had ever had in their entire lives. Jesus has conquered death for us and sin. Let us live our lives in preparation for his return. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We praise you. God, we thank you. What our words are so insufficient. What a unimaginably creative mind you have how generous how loving God you do everything well you never judge too harshly God you never uh, you never judge too softly you never reward more than you should God you never in your, in your anger, in your judgment, go overboard. In your love, in your generosity, you are never careless. Uh, in your plan for us and your creation, God, it is, it is wonderful and glorious. 
It is so good. We are so glad that you are God and you are the God that you are, Lord. We praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing and respond to uh, God and his word one more time this morning. Let's sing How Great the Chasm. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my the promise your buried body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me jesus yours is the that 